The True Origins of the Neo-Pagan Movement Known as Wicca by Truth-Seeking Spirits Publications Introduction The idea of reclaiming something lost is a special feeling. For many of us, things don't feel right these days. Then we turn on the news and hear about a group of people who claim to have rediscovered their old gods, who practice magic and gather together in secret groups and covens. It all sounds very exciting. It was for me anyway. However, it's easy for us to put on blinders when we are having fun. It's easy for us to ignore some things that don't make sense and to make excuses. It's even easier when there are people knowingly and unknowingly spreading false information to back their very shaky spiritual authority. In this essay, we're going to explore the true origins of Wicca that even many Wiccans aren't aware of. We'll then show how many of the claims being spread by some in the community are purely fabricated or fantasist. Your relationship with God should be a serious one built on truth. Any relationship built on lies is destined to leave you feeling hollow. Please provide me with your patience and read on, for the reward is worth it. Origins Wicca is a predominantly Western movement whose followers practice witchcraft and nature worship, and who see it as a religion based on pre-Christian traditions in, of Northern and Western Europe. It spread through England in the 1950s and subsequently attracted followers in Europe and the United States. Like in our earlier essay on Azatru and Norse Paganism, we see that Wicca came to be known primarily during the rocky post-war period in England, and grew during the hippie movement that followed shortly after. But who got it all started? Was it an ancient way of life as some practitioners claim? Short answer is no. Wicca was started by a man known as Gerald Gardner, who was born in 1884 and worked as an author, amateur anthropologist, and archaeologist. Gardner was a bit of an adventurer as well, and his travels brought him to the far-off lands of Borneo, where he befriended members of the Dayak tribe, and became fascinated with their magical religious beliefs, tattoos, and weapons. Gardner also traveled to Singapore, Cambodia, Vietnam, and other areas of the Southeast Asia, where he learned a great deal about Eastern esoteric practices and spirituality. Upon finally returning home to Britain, Gardner had amassed a great deal of information, and ended up becoming involved with a fellow traveler and occultist, Aleister Crowley. Who was Aleister Crowley? Aleister Crowley is an incredibly important figure to explore if one wishes to understand the state of esotericism and the occult in the Western world today. His life will require many pages to fully explain, but here is a summary. Often referring to himself as the B666, Baphomet, Hymenaeus Alpha, and other titles, Crowley was not afraid of controversy. Born the son of a traveling preacher, Crowley's family was part of the very strict Plymouth Brethren sect of Christianity, a schismatic group that grew out of the Anglican Church. Denied the better part of his childhood by his incredibly strict parents, Crowley began to rebel and look to the beings in the Book of Revelations for inspiration. It is said that Crowley's own mother began to refer to him as the Beast, of which he reveled in. Later in his life, Crowley became the Prophet of the Lima, a new esoteric religion that spread the idea of a new aeon, a period of time, when the Egyptian war god Horus would take ascendancy and bring forth a new age. Crowley claimed to have received the holy book for Thelema, the Book of the Law, from a disembodied consciousness in Egypt while visiting there with his young wife. Crowley later went on to believe that this being, known as Iwas, was his holy guardian angel, a term with very different connotations in the esoteric community. From there, Crowley went on to become a member and later leader of a Germanic Austrian society modeled after Freemasonry, known as the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis. The OTO was a secretive, secretive initiation-based society, with many levels of degrees and initiations within it. Perhaps what interested Crowley most of all, though, was her interest in sex magic, something of which Crowley was already apparently well-versed in, as they accused him of stealing their secrets on the matter. As a friend of Crowley, Gerald Gardner ended up joining the OTO, where he was initiated to the third degree and given a charter that allowed him to open his own OTO lodge and to initiate members. The original charter still exists and is believed to be held by the OTO in the state of Georgia today. At this time, we begin to see the true origins of the Wiccan philosophy and ritual. Followers of Gardner's form of Wicca, known today as Gardnerian Wicca, will recognize the three degree structure of their own initiations and the influence of Crowley's OTO's sex magic and rituals like the Great Rite, and also the concept of skyclad, ritual nudity, which was used in Crowley's own ritual, the Gnostic Mass. Perhaps even more blatant, the Wiccan read of, if it harm none, do what thou wilt, is simply rephrasing of uh, Thelema's read of, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law. Romanticism and the Volkish Movement In Wicca, we can see the influence of the Romanticist movement, Romanticism being the artistic, literary, and intellectual movement that rejected the Great Enlightenment and industrialization in favor of an idealized or glorified version of the past, one that pushed emotion as superior to rationality. Likewise, we see echoes of the Volkish movement, meaning folk movement, which began in the area in and around Germany, 
and preached an idealized form of pre-Christian Germanic culture and ideas. This was tied into a sort of romantic nationalism with people taking back their gods and cultures. The problem being though that none of the pre-Christian groups kept any real written records, making the whole thing a bit of a fantasy. That said though, the Volkisch movement was incredibly popular and was arguably the largest group in the German conservative revolutionary movement that sprang up during the Weimar Republic era. We can see Romanticism then as a unique way of thinking and Volkishness being the placement of these ideas into a nationalistic or ethnic form of government, with both likely influencing Gardner and Aleister Crawley. It's interesting to note that almost all modern neo-pagan movement began around the same time period and were likely influenced by these two schools of philosophical belief. A tree without roots. Look at as thoroughly a tree without roots, or at least a tree with roots so short that a simple push can send the whole thing falling over. While many proponents claim it to be an ancient religion, there is simply no evidence of this at all. Agreeably, there are male and female goddesses in almost every ancient pagan pantheon, but the claim ownership of them all as some sort of universal witch cult is highly disingenuous. There is no religious authority in Wicca, which may sound good to some, but this robs it of its ability to govern itself. Wicca instead has fallen into the same trap as all other branches of neo-paganism. It tries to be all things to all people, and with the lack of authority, anyone can claim themselves to be a priest or priestess, and thus get into a great mischief by leading the ignorant or gullible astray. This problem has led to Wicca having an innumerable amount of offshoots, most of wildly different theology, beliefs, rituals, and understandings. Chaotic, unformed, and spiritually flaccid. It's here that we see the influence of Martin Luther, the former Catholic priest who we all remember for nailing his demands to the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg. Luther believed that all individuals should have access to the Bible and be free to make their own judgments, that by faith and grace alone would they be saved. While this may sound sweet to many of our modern ears, it led to an innumerable amount of cults, each preaching their own new version of the truth. This also led to the de-intellectualization of the church, of a growing disconnect between the church's 2,000 plus year history, colleges, saints, and its libraries of religious lore. We can see this echoed today in the pagan community as a whole as anyone is capable of creating their own version of Wicca and setting standards they themselves feel adequate for priesthood or priestesshood. Appropriation of Foreign Religions The majority of rituals we see in Wicca follow the line of New Age thinking combined with a mix of Eastern and Western esotericism. Meditation, tarot readings, crystal charms, talismans, wands, dream catchers, chakras, yoga, OTO and Mason inspired initiations, Sex magic and the worship of any and all gods or goddesses, which by the vapid nature of Wicca's belief, are all true and equally valid. Voodoo, spirit possession, hexes and curses. One would be hard pressed to find anything in Wicca that is genuinely its own. In a way, we see Wicca following suit with most modern schismatic forms of Christianity, a form of worship where one thinks of their religion as a business and bends it to conform with their own biases and vices. If God must be so pliable as to bend to every individual whim, then is it God being worshipped, or is it just the worship of oneself instead? What can be done? Your spirituality and relationship with the divine is something that should be taken seriously. Given the above, the truth seeker is left with two options. Option one is to accept that there are following a modernist religion that fills in its lack of history with the work of other religions, one that grew out of the teachings of Aleister Crawley one with no true spiritual authority, where the adherents will be required to accept all viewpoints to exist within the community. Option two is to walk down the harder road of self-introspection and to seek the truth. One can still enjoy fantasy, walks in nature, the playing of drums, the study of heritage and a night of candlelight and incense, but it can be done in truth. Discover what was hidden from you. For those that sought out Wicca because they felt dissatisfaction with the state of the various Christian churches in their country, I empathize. Please permit this quick bit of history so you can understand why so many Christian churches are in the sorry state they are today. Those that have already read the essay on Norse Paganism will see the same information repeated here. The original Christian church, hereby called Orthodox Christianity, spread across the Roman Empire long ago. The church had five major centers of Christian population called the Pentarchy. Those five cities, Rome, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria, were run by bishops that were also called patriarchs. All bishops shared equal rank, but these five were shown extra respect due to the power of the cities they served in. The Pope, being the Bishop of Rome where the Emperor lived, was called a first among equals as another show of respect. Time passed and the Western people of Europe, especially the Germanic people, of whom their Pope, Pope Leo IX, had come from, won a greater control in the Church. The Pope wished to be the highest authority and people disagreed. After a protracted argument, the Church split in half. 
Since then, we've seen the Western Church split again into Lutheranism, again into the Anabaptists, Anglicans, Episcopalians, Baptists, Methodists, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, and so forth. We see that once one loses their foundation of truth and tradition, they quickly lose the wisdom that came with it. Now, very much like the pagan community, the Christian community in the West is chaotic, with little agreement and sometimes radically different views on theology. But there is that which still stands strong. The Orthodox Church, despite the constant attacks from Islamic forces to the East, attacks from crusading forces to the West, and the scourge of communism and fascism, which murdered untold millions of innocent people. For 2,000 years it has endured, and stuck to its beliefs. A church with a verifiably real, deep roots, a true spiritual authority, divorced from the horrors of the Inquisition in the West, true to itself, a servant of mankind in the most selfless ways. To find your local Orthodox Church, I recommend using Google Maps, or you can contact us at our Facebook page posted below for assistance. You may see your local church using a name like Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, American Orthodox, and so forth. Don't worry. Inside, they will all be singing the same songs and practicing the same beliefs together. The names simply show where that church's authority is held. As America is a land of immigrants, many immigrants brought their faith with them and kept in contact with their original country. Conclusions Thank you for taking the time to read this essay. I grew up in a non-religious household and spent the better part of my life in search for God. I was involved in Wicca for a number of years and even became an initiated priest. All this while being ignorant of the true origins of the religion and its lack of actual substance. I, like many, drank the Kool-Aid and gave myself over to think and tribal consciousness. Happily ignoring the truth so that I could toe the party line. I hope reading this will save you from making the same, time-wasting mistakes that I did. Thank you for listening and come back for more videos as we explore further topics. In the works will be an essay about Mormonism and eventually Islam, so I'm sure you'll enjoy them. Thanks again.